All right, can you go, ooh, wow, you guys can hear me really well, can't you? All right, my name is uh, Eric Escobar. I'm a security engineer for Barracuda Networks, uh, and today I'm gonna be talking to you guys about discovering and triangulating rogue cell towers. Uh, so a bit about me, oh, that's loud. Uh, I started out as a civil engineer, and when I say started out, I went through, got my bachelor's, my master's, and now I have a PE, I'm a licensed civil engineer. Um, my parents loved that, but I told them I was gonna go into computers, so that, that didn't go over so well. Um, so I've always loved computers. Uh, I've always nerded out on all things wireless. Even before that, I was a licensed ham radio operator. Um, and I also love to automate things. So my chicken coop is automated, opens, closes, feeds them, does the whole thing. Uh, and my sprinklers are run by a cron job. So that's, that's the level of nerd that we're talking. <laughs> Uh, and so three years ago was when I started working at Barracuda Networks. Um, I was previously, about exactly three years ago, pumping water in the middle of a field um, as a civil engineer doing some well maintenance. And then I got a lucky break from my uh, great boss. And he said, hey, you know what? I think you have a good mind for this. Uh, if you want to try the security space, then um, you know, we'd love to have you. And so I took him up on it. And then we headed over to DEF CON. And since then, I've, I've been in all things wireless. Um, so the first year, somebody asked me, are you, are you the fox? And I said, uh, no, I, I'm not the fox. What are you talking about? And they said, hey, uh, I'm doing the wireless CTF. And I said, wireless CTF, I could totally get involved with that. The next year, we came back thinking, we're just going to go look for the fox. And we ended up winning the wireless CTF. Um, so that was really great. And then this year, hopefully, uh, when I get done with this talk, we will have won second year in a row. So that would be pretty awesome, too. Uh, let's see. All right, so a bit about what I do at Barracuda Networks. I'm a security engineer, like I said. So I do incident response stuff with my team, uh, pen testing. We do uh, Red Team Fridays where we bring in pizza and Red Team our network, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I've even been lucky enough to do some social engineering campaigns, phishing campaigns. Uh, and if any of you guys are bug crowd researchers, um, when it was just uh, Barracuda doing it, you probably talked to me at some point in time. Um, I also do infrastructure scanning, and I've done a little bit of IPAM work and uh, multi-factor authentication for uh, Barracuda. All right, so today what we're going to cover is uh, what is a rogue cell tower, why you should care about rogue cell towers, how to detect a rogue cell tower, how to find one after you've detected it, and how you can build a detector at home. And then once you've detected one, what the heck do you do with it? All right, so first up, what is a rogue cell tower? Well, it's something that's purchased by companies, governments, or other hackers, um, and it has the ability to trick your phone into thinking that it's a real cell phone tower. So it's kind of like an evil twin attack if you're familiar with wireless at all. Uh, these are known as IMSI IMSI catchers, interceptors, cell site simulators, stingrays, and there's probably a few other things, but really uh, they're pretty much called cell site simulators or IMSI catchers because stingray is their popular known by is, is a corporate term or it's uh, the, the name of the actual company that makes them. Uh, and rogue cell towers have the ability to collect information about you indirectly just through metadata. And metadata can tell you a lot of things about you. Uh, call length, uh, numbers that you've dialed, uh, and those kinds of things. And in some conditions, they can even downgrade uh, your connection. Um, and so they can listen to your messages, your calls, and they can even get some data. All right, so how are they used today? I'm not going to go over this a whole lot, but, but pretty much the ACLU has identified 66 agencies in 24 states that own stingrays. Um, these have been used to monitor demonstrations in the United States, such as in uh, Chicago and the political protests. Last year there was uh, Freddie Martinez. He talked at the Crypto Village, and he did a great talk on uh, Freedom of Information Act requests and dealing with MZ catchers and how to prove that they're actually being used. Uh, and then it's also possible to make an MZ catcher at home um, Chris back in DEF CON uh, 18, uh, he made an actual MZ catcher and showed it off and that was way more technical than I could probably ever hope to do in any time soon. But it, it's a really cool trick, or not trick, it's a really cool hack and uh, from there basically we're going to see if we could detect what he did. So if you want to know more about cell site simulators or if this is the first time that you've ever heard that, uh, go check out the EFF and the ACLU. They have these two um, great links and they're awesome for just getting a lot more information and it goes far more in depth than I could do in, in even a full presentation about that. 
Um, and so abroad they're also used, there's not a whole lot of great data on this, but we know that there have been, you know, sightings of these in Ireland, the UK, China, Germany, Norway, South Africa. Um, Chinese spammers are also caught using this to send spam phishing messages and they're used by governments and corporations alike and, and I think corporate espionage is also where they're used. In terms of uh, there's a lot of other data that they would probably want from their competitors and if somebody doesn't have a way to detect a cell site simulator, you could be giving up corporate secrets uh, without even knowing it. So let's talk about what the IMSI is in IMSI Catcher. So IMSI stands for International Mobile Subscriber Identity. Uh, it's used as a means of identifying a device on the cell network. It's typically 15 digits long um, and it contains information about your device. So there's the MCC which is the mobile country code, the MNC which is the network code and there's the mobile subscription identity identification number or MSIN. Um, so all of the country codes, the MCC are available on Wikipedia so if you want to look one up, maybe you make one of these devices and you want to say hey that doesn't look like uh, the United States country code and if you're in the United States, you know, what, what should mine be? Um, and you see something come up, you can take a look at these, they're all on Wikipedia. Same thing with MNC, all of these are available, there's a big list of them. So if you're ever curious, you can just head on over there and check it out. Uh, so basically to summarize all that, an IMZ is a unique identifier to your device. So that, that's you. I mean that's like your MAC address of your laptop. That, that's what can identify your device. And so if you swap, you know, a, uh, your SIM card into different phones, then that's something that, that can still identify that SIM card itself. And so here's what a, a sample IMZ would look like. So you can see it has the MCC which is 310 for the USA, it has the MNC for AT&T uh, and that's 026 and then the unique identifier which is your MSIN. So why should you care about this? Well, if somebody were to drive up uh, and have an MZ catcher, you know, maybe you're sitting there and you're having coffee at a coffee shop, um, you're one big fish in, in that, or you're one fish in that big net. Uh, so what could happen is if they're driving up and say they're, say somebody's looking for someone in the area and they think that they're there, they grab all of the information because your phone, it just goes for the song, strongest signal strength. And so if they, if it happens to be that, that MZ catcher, then that's you. And it doesn't matter if it's a government, it doesn't matter if it's a hacker. These things are easy to build for less than, you know, a couple grand. Um, and to get all that personal information, it could be well worth it. And also there was a talk of LTE downgrade to GSM this year. Uh, and so that's another thing that you, a uh, cell tower, um, controls, you know, some of the options that are sent to the mobile device. And so if they want to downgrade you, you can totally do that. I saw a couple times when I was upstairs in the wireless village, that uh, what had happened is it downgraded from uh, LTE to 2G and you knew something bad was going on. Um, uh, so that, that's just one way is, is you're just a small fish in a big net and they can catch anybody that's around you. All right, so why should you care about this? Well, I think if, if you don't know by now, there's a couple of reasons why you should. Um, your phone will connect automatically to cell site simulators. It, it doesn't matter, you know, it's not like a, connecting to an access point with your cell phone. What will happen is uh, your phone will just pick the thing that has the strongest signal. It doesn't ask you, it doesn't say, hey, this one looks kind of fishy. It just says, hey, this one gives me the best signal. Let's go from there. Um, and thieves can steal your personal information. Hackers can track where you go, who you're talking to, and then grab all sorts of data about you. Uh, your digital life can be sniffed out of the air by anyone and I mean it's the hardware is always coming down in cost. Um, and your company could be leaking trade secrets. I mean just think about two factor authentication if it's sent over SMS and they can intercept that. Um, you know, then they could have that second factor if they've already got your password. Uh, not to mention a lot of people think that text messages are um, you know, th they're extremely private and if you don't believe so, just ask somebody, hey, can I flip through your text messages real quick? They won't let you. All right, so why build a detector? So there's some Android phones that have apps that, you know, that you can do this. But I found that you need to have a specific model and you also need to have it root to work. Um, and I wanted something cheaper. I didn't want to have a phone dedicated only to just watching uh, cell towers. Um, and I also wanted a device that was really cheap. I mean, I'm, I just want something that's, you know, around $50 so that it's easy to make and it's not like, oh, well you could totally detect them for a couple grand. Um, and I also wanted to be able to set it and forget it and I wanted to be alerted to any anomalies. I didn't want to have to be something where I got suspicious all of a sudden I had to go turn it on and figure out how to rig it all up. Um, I wanted to be, and I wanted the ability to network them together. So if I wanted three, if I wanted five, if I wanted a hundred, I wanted the ability to just plug it into the network and have them all talk to each other. 
So how do you actually detect a rogue cell tower? Well, every cell tower or a base transceiver station, BTS, beacons out information about itself. And this is available to your phone. Um, but, you know, it has stuff like the, the radio frequency channel number that it's on. We talked about the MCC, the MNC, the cell ID, the location area code, so that's specific to where you actually are. Um, the transmit power and some neighboring cells. Neighboring cells I haven't had a lot of luck with, but all the rest should still be enough to, to do it. Um, so like I said, these values should remain pretty constant. You know, you don't want your country code to change because if you're not in the United States, then all of a sudden you, I mean, you could have a problem. You, you know that if you're in the United States, you should have a 310. If it's not, then something, something else is going on. Um, the MNC, your network code shouldn't change. The cell tower, the unique identifier shouldn't change. The area code shouldn't change. And the transmit power, that shouldn't also, that should also not change. Uh, now there's reflections and things and, and ways that that can change. But overall, at, at a period of time, it should just average out. Um, so, okay, so how do you, so if, if values deviate from what you've expected, it can mean that there's some maintenance taking place. It's not necessarily that, hey, all of a sudden transmit power went down or maybe a cell tower went down. Uh, it could just mean that something is deviated. And it can just be, mean that changes are being made to the network. Um, but that's the whole reason why I wanted to be able to go find it. Because if there's a new signal that's coming out, I want to go see, hey, is this a cell tower that's messing up? Or is this, you know, maybe they're adding some extra, you know, carriers to it. There could be something actually happening. So the ability to go out and find it is, is really crucial to knowing if something's actually happening. And really the way that this works is it's like a, ba it's like you're, you're taking a baseline. And so you're sitting there and you're watching the neighborhood. You're watching to see, you know, what cars go in and out. Um, and you're being familiar with what's in your airspace. And if something drastically different hops in your airspace, you know that, hey, maybe I should be suspicious of this and maybe I need to go check it out. So these are just some sample values. 310, again, the United States. 026 is AT&T. The unique ID for the cell tower and the radio channel that it's on. If any of those change or, you know, the tower goes completely away or a new tower comes up in its place with a really strong signal strength, you know that it's something you should probably look at. All right, so how, so, so let's, let's just do a quick example of this. Um, if a new tower pops up with an unknown cell tower ID and have high transmission power, you know, the mobile country code can mismatch, the frequency can mismatch, um, and, you know, maybe the location area code could change too. These are all things to keep in mind, all things to look for. They don't all need to change, but a couple of changes here and there are enough to be suspicious of. And so obviously, why locate a tower? Well, you want to know if it's a cell tower or if it's a van with a tower inside of it. And now, now let's talk about actually locating them. So I'm going to combine all of this unique cell tower data, receive power, and location. And uh, the easiest way that I found is to combine all of that information on one detector that can be moved around. If you just have a couple of detectors spread out, you know, say throughout a neighborhood or something, um, you're not going to get as great a data as if you can just move around because then you can take a bunch of different points. And we'll talk about that later on. So this is an example heat map that I made. And I, this is just me driving around and I selected one tower. And this is, this is me practicing on an actual tower. This isn't a rogue cell tower. This is just me driving around and seeing like, hey, let's see if I can find uh, what an actual tower is, you know, kind of as a, as a blind test. And so when I plotted up the data, here this is, you know, you can see that red spot and that's where signal strength is highest. And that comes down to probably about a 20, 30 meter radius. And that's enough to tell, is there a tower poking up out of the ground that's a couple hundred feet? Um, it's really easy to tell if there's nothing there or if there is something there. Or maybe on top of a building there's some antennas. Um, it's a good way of telling, you know, does that look shady or is that, you know, a van parked outside my street or some, you know, hacker or kid sitting in the back of a car. Um, so multiple de detectors with known locations allow for trilateration of suspected, you know, towers. Um, and the received power and distance, are, they're not inversely proportional. You'll need some regression formulas and they're required to calculate in order to fine tune the results. It's less accurate but it's still pretty good. And the TDOA or time distance of arrival, this is another way that I thought like, hey, maybe I can find a cell tower this way. But really, I don't have an accurate enough time. And if you're not familiar with what TDOA is, it's a way to, um, you know, you're waiting for a signal to come in and you're measuring the speed or the length of time that it takes uh, a light signal to come from that tower to wherever you are. And measuring the time, it's kind of like GPS. It works with, you know, the speed of light stays constant. And so you can use that to kind of do some math. But you need a really accurate clock and that's not something that I have. And so I thought, okay, well, that's not going to work. 
Oh, am I going back the other way? All right, so now I'm gonna talk about trilateration versus triangulation. So a lot of people get mad at me when I inversely use these, um, and I get it, but some people don't, and when I was doing this presentation before, there was a lot of questions about it, so I'm gonna go over it real quick. Um, if this is something you already understand, great, you get a refresher, and if you don't, hopefully you know the difference. All right, so like any good engineer, I have my north arrow for my free body diagram. Uh, and so let's, let's picture that there's an explosion or a really loud sound. The way triangulation works is if you're at home and if your friends at the store, maybe your wife's at work, and you all hear the same big explosion, you're all gonna look in the same, or you're all gonna look in the direction of the explosion. And so if you were to intersect all the lines of where you guys are looking, you're gonna see pretty much a pretty good representation of where the explosion probably happened. If you all call each other and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm at home, I'm looking you know, towards the southeast, and if I'm at the store, I'm looking west, and I'm at work looking north, you can have a pretty good idea of kind of where it came from. Um, and so triangulation, the angle there from the north arrow, you know, to wherever direction you're looking, that's the angle that you're actually talking about. And a lot of people get that confused with what trilateration is. Um, and so with, with triangulation, you have your known points of where you are, and you can use that to find, you know, the very center of that triangle. So this is something that I've wanted to do. I've wanted to add this feature. Uh, I didn't have enough time to do it before this, but if somebody wants to help me work on it, I'd love to take up any helpers. Um, so conceptually, this makes sense, but I haven't actually tried it out. And so what I want to do is basically put like an RF shielded dome on top of my antenna and have it spin around. And when it spins around, uh, at some point when it hits where, it, when it lines up where the cell tower is, it'll have a high signal strength. So right now, if uh, you see this, uh, like this is a cross section of it, if the cell tower is right in line with where the slice is in it, you'll have a high signal strength reading as this spins around. And then you can tell right here the signal is being blocked because it's RF shielded, and so you'll have a lower signal. And so if you spin this all around and you have multiple detectors, you have different angles, and when all those angles intersect, that's typically where it's gonna be. So this is all just conceptual. I haven't done this one. This isn't how I normally do it, but it's, it's something I just throw out there. And so technically my detector uses trilateration. And so this is kind of, this is a, a good representation of what I mean by that. So trilateration is just magnitude of what's being felt. So say you're 100 feet away from a cell tower, you'll have full bars. Say you're 300 feet, you know, you maybe only have two bars. 1,000 feet, it drops off to a single bar. So you know that you're a certain distance away based on your signal. However, you don't know, um, you know, what direction that's coming in. And so uh, if you're 100 feet away, that cell tower could be in a circle anywhere that's 100 feet away from you. And likewise, you know, if you have a weak signal strength, you know that, hey, you could be about 1,000 feet away from that tower, uh, but it could be anywhere on that big circle. So how do you fix this? Well, you add more detectors. And so say you have two detectors that are there, uh, you know, they have the same power strength, then you're gonna have two cell tower, you know, possibly two cell towers uh, where those two circles intersect. And so how do you determine if it's, you know, only or which one of those it is? You add a third detector, and then where all three of those circles intersect, that's where your cell tower most likely is, or in and around that area. But that's a way that you can, you know, get rid of just knowing uh, the power level that it's at. Uh, and so, again, you do a lot of math. There are plenty of Python scripts, plenty of Bash scripts, plenty of other ways that you can easily calculate this when you know where you are and the magnitudes that you're feeling. Um, so that's one of those things. If you don't know how to do it, just Google it. There's plenty of information out there. Um, so how do you actually locate that tower? Well, power, it's not, it's not linear. Um, you'll need more data, you'll need more monitoring nodes, and you'll need to do back of the envelope math. So what I mean to say is that you're not gonna directly find, you know, the square, you know, one foot by one foot area where this tower is transmitting from, but it's good enough to get you in the general vicinity of it. Um, and cell towers, they also have different sectors, so they're not just a perfect omnidirectional antenna that radiates in all directions. So that's why having multiple detectors helps you kind of work out the fuzzy math and help you actually find out where it is. Um, and so that's why I like the multi-point trilateration. So you get a lot of points, you collect a lot of data, and it gives you a lot more accurate results. And so obviously I, I don't have a rogue cell tower that I can just test it with, and I'm not gonna make one and have the FCC get mad at me. So I uh, tested this on just real towers and say, hey, maybe this is a cell tower, you know, that's, that's a rogue one. Let's pretend like it's rogue and I wanna go check it out. So that's, that's kind of just drove around town and saw what was out there. Um, so, yeah, back to this slide again. You can tell there's probably a tower in this area, and sure enough, if I were to show you the Google Maps of where this is, there's absolutely a tower there. All right, so let's talk about the actual build itself. 
I used a Raspberry Pi 3 power adapter and an SD card running the stock Raspbian. All this stuff is really, um, you know, there's plenty of guides on how to set this up. Then I bought a SIM 900 GSM module. It's all available on Amazon. You can go there. It's like $17. I'll post links to all this and stuff you'll see later on. Um, there's a serial GPS module. Again, $16 off Amazon. Pretty cheap. And then a software defined radio. And now there's more cautionary tales about this, but I'll tell you about that going on. And then it's also made of scrap wood and hot glue. I was gonna like 3D print some really nice case for this and then I figured oh, we're at a hacker conference and this is hacked together so I'm not gonna make it any better because it definitely works. So brace yourself, this is quite literally a hack. If it shows up, there we go. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's, talk, let's break this down and actually see what's there. Uh, okay, so on top you have the GPS module because that extra, you know, seven inches really gives it the height that it needs to get a clear view of the sky. Um, the SIM 900 cell module also goes up on top because, hey, you want the best reception possible. Um, mind you, this is in my passenger seat, so. Uh, then there's on both sides of this to connect the, the Bluetooth and the GPS module together, there's a serial to USB adapter there. And so that, that basically just gives you serial data and that's why I liked using the uh, Raspberry Pi because it gives you four USBs and so it's pretty easy um, to connect it all up and, and set it going so you don't have to burn your CPU on added GPI opens. Um, so again, scrap wood and hot glue, that's pretty much what I always use. And then uh, there's a software defined radio, it's, it's a USB TV tuner, it's, an, it's called an RTL SDR, uh, we'll talk more about that. So that how much does it actually cost? Well, if you want to do this, the Raspberry Pi Zero and really keep costs down, Raspberry Pi Zero is about $10, so when you include shipping with it, uh, $5 wireless adapter off Amazon, you know, $5 USB hub, $5 SD card, you can shop around and fi find all of this a lot cheaper or, you know, you might just have it sitting somewhere in your bedroom. Um, and then the, the real piece that you probably don't have lying around is the $27 uh, SIM 900 module. And you can just buy this off Amazon. It's, you know, FCC regulated, has all its FCC IDs, um, and then there's also the $16 serial GPS module. And if you want to get a little bit nicer one, I got the Adafruit model. It's about $40, but it gets the job done a lot nicer. It's a lot quicker to fix positions. So in total, it's, fi oh. in total, it's $52. Um, and again, you can make it even cheaper than that depending on where you source some of your materials from. So let's talk about the SIM 900 module. Um, so it, it will give you uh, a whole list of commands and this is the typical modem AT commands that I didn't know anything about um, and so I had to dig into. A and their, their guide that they have online has a ton of different commands you can just read through it and one of the ones that I found is this engineering mode. So when you toss the SIM 900 and when you give it the AT commands which I'll go through in a little bit, um, it'll show you hey okay it's good to go and it'll give you seven towers with the highest information. Um, and there's a ton of information and it's all via serial connection. So if, if you know how to use serial, it's all exactly the same. And what's even better is there's no SIM card required just to put it in engineering mode. And I just also want to stress this, that does not sniff any traffic. This is FCC regulated. This is not doing anything bad. This is everything that your phone can see that you can see on your phone. Um, and I'll go over how you can actually see this on your phone to some degree. Not, not nearly as good as this, but um, let's move on. So there's uh, something called field test mode which most phones have. Uh, if you have an iPhone, if you just pretend to dial a number and you put in star 3001, you know, pound 12345, pound star, uh, that'll bring in field test mode. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trolling you, that actually will do it. Um, and this is a good way to see a lot of information about uh, what's around you. Now it's a little bit hard to navigate and if you want you can Google and there are plenty of guides that show you how to use this field test mode. Um, with Android, the, it can vary from phone to phone, so just Google it, you can find it. Uh, and there's also plenty of other apps since Android is much more open that you can see. Um, so here's, here's a quick example of what the SIM 900 readout is. So AT to just check if it's okay. Um, and then the, that's setting it in engineering mode. And then uh, after that you check, hey engineering mode, you know, what do you have for me? And then it will relay a bunch of data. And at first I looked at this and I was like, I have absolutely no idea what this means. So let's, let's dig into it. Um, and so basically you have your channel number, your receive level, you have your, uh, you have your base station identifier code, your cell ID, your MCC and your MNC and your LAC. These are all things that we talked about. 
Um, and so for, so this is the GPS serial that I got. This is a little bit nicer than the one that you can get online, but uh, the, the cheap one will definitely do. This is the Adafruit model and it fixes, the reason I picked it is because it fixes the position very quickly and has great indoor reception and it, it works exactly like you would expect it to work. Um, it just, you plug it in and it just starts dumping data. And when it, I say dumping data, I, this is exactly what I saw when I first plugged it in. And this scrolls so fast that to take the screenshot it was hard not to get it to blur. Um, so you can get idea, uh, you know, I looked at this like I don't even know what this means. Luckily, you know, there's plenty of information online on how to handle this uh, data. And so you break it down, you really only care about this type of a line. Uh, and this line, you know, when you translate it out and dump it in the SQL database that I have it set up to go into, you get your latitude, your longitude, the number of satellites that you have, the GPS quality, the altitude, and the units of that altitude. Uh, the GPS quality too, it goes zero, one, two. Zero is if you don't have a fix and it doesn't know where you are. One if it's not that accurate but it'll still do and two if it's locked on and you have a good positioning. Uh, so next up is Raspberry Pi 3. Pretty straightforward, um, runs stock Raspbian as the operating system and it has the, enough power to run the software defined radio. So I use this uh, Raspberry Pi to do other software defined radio stuff and it's set up to use it. Um, and so I just, you know, I just repurposed that I didn't want to have to get something else. And it also has four USB ports which is really nice because you can plug in the, as many serial adapters as you want with a hub and it works, it works a lot better than trying to use any GPIO pins as a serial adapter. And it's also really easily powered by a USB battery pack. You can get one of these battery packs online for like say five, ten dollars um, and you could run it all day off of this because it's so low power. So now next I want to talk to you guys about the, the I guess semi controversial part of this. So there's the TV tuner. This is, so this is designed so you get a USB and you can uh, basically you plug this in and you can, you know, watch uh, TV on your phone, any of the broadcast, ch or not TV on your phone, TV on your laptop, any of the broadcast channels that are out there. Um, it has a wide range of frequencies and is typically used by a lot of hackers to do really cheap software to find radio because it's $20. Um, however, depending where you are, this could be definitely against the law to listen to GSM traffic. So I don't want to encourage this at all if this is not legal where you are. Um, but there are plenty of GitHub repositories out there that will let you listen into unencrypted traffic uh, and, and not to break it. We're not breaking any GSM traffic. Um, and it's not necessary at all to locating the towers. It just gives you some deeper insights if that's something that you're interested in uh, in trying out. And if you do, just let me know how it works because I'd be really interested in hearing it. Um, so basically everything dumps to a SQLite database. Uh, it, it's pretty simple when you, when you look at this because I just basically went through in the Python script and it just goes through, goes, you know, every couple seconds and it'll snag all the data that's out there and it dumps it and it lets you do a lot of queries on it so you know you can, you have your time of where you are, your time, where you are, you have your latitude, longitude, you know, all the information that we just talked about all in one nice and neat place. And uh, you know, after you take a drive, you don't want to have to go through and look through, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of cell, of cell data. I mean, it's going to suck and there's no way to really define anything meaningful out of that. Um, so that's why uh, you want to make it pretty. You want to make it really easy to look at. You want to make it so that you can show a picture to your wife, mom, cat, and then, you know, say, hey, this is what I did. And they're like, oh, that's not just numbers on a screen. Um, and so uh, when I was in civil engineering, I used a ton of GIS software, but it's really expensive. And so that's when I came across QGIS. It's completely free, open source. Um, and basically what this does, it's like kind of like Google Maps. You can place points and you can do math between those points. Um, and it's, it's a really extensive program. So I could do a full talk on just how to use QGIS and, and all the stuff to learn. But some of the things that you're going to want in QGIS, you're going to want IDW or inverse distance weighting. You want the open layers plugin. This will give you maps and GIS data. And you also want, uh, or it also gives you Python command line automation. And it's, it's super easy once you visualize it and, it and it lets you just, you know, actually get your hands on the data and make sense of it. Now, what I really, really like about this is that uh, once you've done everything the right way, once you're comfortable with how to do this in the GUI, it has a full command line set. So you can know exactly what you're doing and then script it all up. So you can just run a cron job and have it, you know, pump out nice looking images all the time. Um, and with that, with the Python script, then you can have it say, hey, you know, this doesn't look right. I want to send an alert out. And we'll talk more about alerts here in a little bit. But basically this is just a sample of like, hey, how am I going to import data and get the X, Y and power information and stuff like that into it. 
And so this is just a sample of just me just making some random points kind of uh, in the program itself. And you can see that you can overlay maps to it. You can have street data. You can even have satellite data. Um, this is a great program if you're just looking for anything GIS related and you just want to get started in GIS because it's a very similar to ArcGIS. So if you're looking to get into maybe some professional tools, check this out first. It's good for a lot of other things, not just finding rogue cell towers. All right, so the next part of this is Okay, so you've detected that there's a disturbance in the forest. You see that, okay, my, my maps are showing me that there might be a new tower somewhere. You know, I'm getting these notifications. So, wh you know, what the heck do you do? How do you actually get this information to you? You know, so you're at the grocery store and you know that there's something outside or maybe there's, you know, a new cell tower popping up. How do you know? How do you get that information to yourself? There's a couple of ways. Um, so you can, if, depending on what your favorite scripting language is, you can go in there and have it just send you a straight email. A lot of people don't check their email, you know, very frequently. So you maybe you want to have it set up with Twilio and have it send you a text message. Uh, Twilio is about $20 a year if you just want to send a couple text messages. It's really great. They have a great documentation. I highly recommend using them. And if you're a little bit more technical and you just want to send push notifications to your phone, I use an app called uh, Pushover. And it allows you to send, just like it says, push notifications. It's really great. Gives you a ton of different settings. So now here's the problem that I have. Uh, when your detector goes off, what the heck do you do? Um, well, you turn off your phone. I mean, if you're not really sure and you're actually nervous about your privacy being infringed upon, just turn off your phone. Um, that's, that's really the only thing you can do. Uh, and then you can start looking at the data. You can take what I, you know, the maps that I've shown you how to make and you can look at it and say, oh, wh where is this? Let's go take a look at it. And then maybe you go on a road trip. And with this, you can just go out there and you can, um, you know, you can, you can go see, hey, is there anything out there? Uh, am I nervous, you know, that something's, you know, going to be where it's not, shouldn't be? Or you could just say, hey, it looks like they're doing some maintenance on a tower somewhere. Um, so this allows you the opportunity to go drive around and see what's actually out there. And with that, I think that's it. At, um, if you guys want, just send me an email to this email address and I'll answer any questions. And I'll, I'll be posting the slides by Friday uh, to this website, ragingsecurity.ninja, so feel free to go check it out. And yeah, I really encourage you guys to shoot me an email.